But this is a warning. There will be some episodes you see on this channel that may disturb some people, may bring back bad memories for some people, family members, friends. And we just want to apologize in advance for that. We on here talking Brooklyn history, real Brooklyn history, real New York history, real Rikers Island history. You know, and sometimes that history is a little dark. So let's listen, let's pay attention, and let's all grow. You heard? This is therapy for the streets. Black knowledge. The Sumner series. My thoughts was all murder, homie. All murder, pure murder, nothing short of murder. Like, I don't care by any means if I, you know, murder, murder. Like I said, we got the uh, we got the HDL sentence to the island, and um, I think I, I'm not sure if I told you that part, but I think I told you that uh, when we was in the bullpen, I guess waiting to go to the uh, to the bing or whatever. I guess I, I don't know if they didn't have a uh, room in the bing or whatever, but they sent us the um, they sent us all the population. Now that I think about, it, I'm not sure if if um, I think they sent Hound Dog to the bing because I think Hound Dog, if I'm not mistaken, he had crazy bang time like over 200 something days or something like that so I believe that Hound Dog might have been one of the only people or um, somebody else might have been a couple of the only people that went to the bank because the times that they had was significant We might, I might have had like 90 days some shit like that but they had Hound Dog days was in the hundreds so he didn't go to population but anyway they sent us the population they sent us I think to 7 and 8 block we all thought we was going to go to the same block. And, you know, we had, in our minds, we we were like, yeah, when we get into our uh, population, it's like seven of us or whatever. If we go, we all go to the same house. So we're going to take the phone. My little man, I think it was probably named Bar Kim or whatever. I'm not too sure. But he was like, yeah, when we get in there, we're going to take the phone and all this and all that. So, you know, i never been to HDM, but I'm prepared or whatever. But they separated us. Some went to this block, some went to that to the next block but when I got into the block that I got into and I actually saw HDM on the inside for the first time what it was like I was like oh nah <laughs> that, that 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 place wasn't nothing that I imagined it to be and um I knew that it was that I was really in prison man. like you know what I mean the full building was whatever it was cool dorms and shit like that kitty shit whatever young shit Brooklyn House, same thing, like small, small, probably 15, 20, 30 dudes, probably to a side, small. Now, HDM, now that was a, that was a, that was a different animal, homie. That shit reminded me of, um, the, the prison movies, like, that I saw as a kid, like, Penitentiary, shit like that, like, I don't know if you ever been in HDM, but they got the long, long gallery. Before I got there, all three tiers was open. See, bottom that's... tier, the top tier, and the third tier on the top. The wildest shit I saw was when I first walked in there, what 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 intrigued me the most and what made me realize how real it was was how big it was, right? So I'm like, damn, it went all the way to the back. So now I'm like Literally, that shit is like a New York City block. That bro, that's why I'm trying to I'm a, I'm about to try to paint a vivid picture for all those who who've never been to HM but probably heard stories with them. So let's say, just for, for you know, just for the sake of our uh, argument, let's say it's like 20, or let's say it's like 30 something cells or maybe 40 cells on, you know, 40 cells in a row. So it's, so it's two sections. It's the first section when you first walk in. So let's say you on the, you, you walk in and you're in the first set of cells and let's say it went from one through 40. And then, there's a staircase in the front right there then at the end of them 40 cells in that first section is a, a, a middle stairway area where you go up to the next tier and then another set of 40 cells if it was 40 whatever the number is go all the way to the back that's a long stretch homie mm -hmm. 
because the cells was whatever size they was. So you you imagine 20, 30, 40 of those in a the row, then some, a wide staircase, and then another 20, 30, 40 rows. In the back, I was like, yeah, that. So the first thing I said, yeah, this this is gonna be interesting because I'm like, you know, from 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 my little interaction in the Brooklyn house when I had that fight over the phone, I'm assuming that any type of work that gets done is going to be in the back. And in that back is a long way from the front. So in my mind, I was like, yo, any type of work you put in here, homie, you better win. Because, <laughs> you know, you better do your thing. Don't, you know what I mean? Don't leave out leaking or don't get them holes put in you you way back there because you probably won't make it to the front, stretch or no stretch. But so the interesting thing was, again, like I said, I, I don't know if I touched on it, but it, at that time, back then when you went to prison, kind of sort of like, you know, dudes always step to you when you first come in, see who you are, what your name is, and where you're from. I guess that was dudes' ways of, you know, I guess finding out if it, it was some official dudes coming in, or if it was some dudes, you know, that was wanted for ratting and all that shit. Because if you was ratting and they knew about it, you was definitely out of there. But um, I walked in, and it was crazy. It was crazy because before I walked in, I mean, when I first walked in, and I'm look, I'm you know, I'm still looking around, and it's about maybe three, four, five of us there that came, and dudes was like, um, dudes coming up front. I guess it must have been the dudes that was running the house. A couple black dudes, they was like, yo, who, who, anybody over here named Knowledge? Who named Knowledge? Anybody in this group named Knowledge? So I'm looking. I don't know the dude and shit. But I'm like, hey, I know that's me. So, but I, you know, so I'm like, there, here we go. I'm like, yeah, I'm Nas, what's up? So he was like, yo, you Kenny Gilmore, nephew? So I'm like, uh, yeah, homie, wow, what's up? And he's like, yo, come to the back. So he took me to the back. And I can't remember this dude's name, too, but for, for life me. And he was a real solid dude. We got real cool over my time being an HDM. But, um, I can't remember his name, but he was from Fort Greene, so whoever, you know, fact checkers or whatever, that remember the story. When I first got the HDM, I went to uh, Seven Block, I believe it was, yeah, Seven, no, Seven Block or Eight Block, I believe it was Eight Block, Two, Four, Six, Eight. So I believe I went to Eight Block, one of them blocks, Eight or Seven, the dude from Fort Greene stepped to me, asked who knowledge was, I said it was me, took me to the back. You know what I mean? And, and, and took me in his cell. So when he took me in his cell, he was like, yo, homie, listen. He was, I guess he was just quickly giving me the run. He was like, yo, KG, that's my big homie. I, I, you his nephew. So, yo, you good? We gonna give you this slot time here. Yo, you gonna do? I, so I was like, ho, 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 ho. I said, listen, homie. First of all, like, you know what I mean? Boom. Cause he yeah, KG, nephew, this. And KG, I'm like, yo, listen, homie. My name knowledge, right? Boom, and I'm my old man. Like, yeah, that's my uncle. My uncle do whatever he do, but I'm knowledge, homie. So I want to be respected for me, for who I am, and for, you know what I mean? The type of work that I'm going to put in and things I'm going to do. He said, all right, cool. Shorty, like, because I was a little dude, he wasn't really trying to hear that. Fuck up. Basically, he's like, shut the fuck up and listen, dude. This is how it's going down. You're going to get this time. You're going to do this, down the third. And then he lifted up his mattress. Yo, last, when that man lifted up his mattress, bro, I seen some of the wild, I didn't, so boom, I remember, I, I'm this. I'm just fresh, really, into the prison system, really getting into it. So, you know, in the full building, you know what I mean, dudes was playing little razor tag, whatever little razor shit, in the Brooklyn house, didn't really have weapons like that. If they did, I didn't have my hands on it. I didn't have access to it, so it was like the mop ringer, and, and, and you know what I mean, the knuckle check, whatever you could do with your hands is what you could do with your hands. When son took me in that cell and said what he said to me and lifted up that mattress, boy, I saw, so that's what I found out, you know, a gun, he put the, he had like three knives in there, big fucking knives, homie, like, like different sizes and shit, I was like, yo, and my mom like, what the fuck is, boy, what is that, like, what, how the fuck did you get that in here, because I never seen no shit like that, I didn't know those was handmade, they was crafted so perfectly that they looked like they came out somebody's kitchen. So I was like, yeah, boy, what the fuck is that? He's like, yo, pick one. And I was like, pick one for what? He was like, yo, just, you know, it get crazy. So if it go down, you gotta be prepared. Anywhere you go, you keep something, one of these on you, 
keep this knife and, 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 and all that and you put your work in and whatever you know you do what you do whatever you can't handle we'll clean up the rest but you you make sure you take one of these and you get into any situations with anybody they say anything to you wrong whatever put on I was like damn so now that's a big difference from from you know what I just experienced in, in, in the fall building when I first came through and bailed back out and then my experience was a Brooklyn house so I'm like alright so it's really real here so I'm like, all right, cool. He was like, yo, go up front, find out uh, what cell you're going in, whatever, whatever. I found out what cell I was going to. And um, I went to my cell, unpacked that little bit of um, shit that I that I had. And then was waiting um, waiting to get on the phone for the, for the little slot time he gave me, whatever. Get on the phone, let my people know I was on the island, HDM, whatever. Before I could even do that, let me see, I, I wasn't even in the house an hour police call me to the front, call me by my government, yo, such such, port to the front, I, so I go to the front, and that homie from Fort Greene and a couple of other dudes that he had, that he introduced me to, they came up to the front with me, and they was like, yo, pack your shit, I was like, pack my shit, I ain't even do nothing, I just got here, I ain't do nothing, they was like, no, pack your shit, you going down the two block, uh, Kenny Gilmore called for you down there, so I'm like, so, so the dudes was like, damn homie, yo, yes, yeah, son, you about to see your uncle strong here so you can't do no dumb shit in here because anything you do is gonna be a reflection of him and on his name but uh yo let him know we had you down here he didn't have to pull you down there like we had you you would have been good down here so i was like damn so i'm like packing my shit and all that you know i'm like all right fuck it it's a new adventure so now i'm packing my shit about to go to two block he's like Dude, damn, I wish I remember his name, man. He called me back, like, yo, no, nah, yo, come back here for a second. He brought me back to the cell. He's like, yo, um, let me get that joint that I gave you. <laughs> 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 He's like, yeah, homie, uh, let me get that joint that you gave me. So my face was like, I'm like, hold on. I thought you said, you know what I mean? Keep this with me, on me at all times. And you know what I mean? If it get crazy, use this to put that in. How you gonna take it back? He was like, nah, nah. <laughs> He was like, nah, shorty, you good. You going down there with Kenny and them, they got all the knives down there that you need. So, you know what I mean? I was like, all right, homie. I gave him back his joint and shit. And, and, um, <clears throat> and then I went down to uh, to uh, HDM and, um, I mean, to Two Block. Went down to Two Block. My uncle and shit, I went there. He was waiting for me on the gate with this big smile on his face because remember last, that I told you that, like, when I was growing up, my uncle was my cheat code. You know what I mean? And he was in jail since I was seven years old. So by this time, and then I was going to see him ever since I was um, seven years old until I started running the streets and catching cases and all that on my own, I was still going to visit my uncle and getting the game and information from him. So as a, he didn't see, he hadn't seen me in a, in a period of time, probably from when I was like, when I came out the house and really started running around like 13, 14, whatever. So, you know, stopped going to visit them around those times and because I was in the streets and doing my own thing. But, you know, we would com communicate over the phone and he would give me the game. So this was the first time that he's seeing me in person, you know what I mean, after all these years. And then he seen me as a, a, you know, a grown man. He had to see me as a man because I'm in a house of detention for men. So I was no longer a little kid, little boy, like his little nephew. So, you know, he's standing there smiling and shit. And, um, you know, I got my face all frowned up and all that when I go. And he's like, what's up? Why are you looking like that? I was like, yo, man, why you pulled me from, from the block I was in down here? Because, all right, so look, this is how I looked at it. Right, last, I felt like, okay, I remember, I told you, he was my cheat code. He was my, like, super duper big homie. He was like my big brother, my pops, all rolled in a one. So this was a person that, that I had to kind of like adhere to what they said because I didn't really listen to nobody but this was one of the people outside of my big homies that gave me advice influenced me whatever not too many people could tell me anything that I would listen to and take heed to this man I respected him so much that this man not only could he have chastised me verbally but he could have physically checked me and I wouldn't have raised my hand to, to, to defend myself against him or nothing, I'd have just ate it like a man because that's how much love and respect that I have for him. So I was upset because in my mind now, I'm like, 
I can't be knowledge. I'm no longer going to be knowledge. I'm going to be KG's nephew. Kenny Gilmore's what they call him was KG. I'm going to be KG nephew. So I'm like, so he took me, we went to his cell, and, he, and I'm like, nah, homie, like, not for nothing. You know what I mean? I love and respect you and all that, but yo, bro, I, you know what I mean? I could have stayed down there with the Fort Greene homies and all that and, and did me. And he's like, see. <laughs> So to him, that was the most stupidest shit ever. And his thing was, you know, them old timers back then, lads, I don't know if you had like an older uncle or older brother. They Everything we did in their eyes was stupid. How old was he at that time? He was about 30, 31. So he was, he was kind of young, but to an 18-year-old, 30, anything is old as shit. So I'm like, damn, I got to be under this dude's wing. He old. I, I, I want to do young shit. Run around and be wild and make my bones and all that. So like I said, everything. So if I'm 18, he probably like 30, 31. So to me, to him, in his eyes, everything I said was, nah, that shit is stupid. Let me show you how to do it. So, you know, my shit was like, whatever. But, but homie, in hindsight, right, it was the best preparation that I would have ever have gotten to prepare me for, you know what I mean, the bid that I was going to ultimately have to face, you know what I mean, moving forward when I went up north into the mountains. So that group of individuals uh, that was in two block with me, it was, I was, it was my uncle, uh, KG, and, and, and he had a, another homeboy from out of Fort Greene named Sharif. Sharif had the biggest fucking hurt cable on and medallion in prison that I, I didn't even know you could wear jewelry in prison like that. Remember, I told you, we always thought, like, yeah, we're going to go to jail, we're going to wear all our jewelry and all that. Nah, I didn't think, you know, I thought it was going to be some regular shit. No, he had the the big cable hurt on that dudes was getting their heads blown off on the streets back in the days and all that Sharif, and he had the big anchor medallion on with the shit, and um, there was another little short boxer dude named uh, Man, from out of Fort Greene, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, I believe he was related to uh to the homie Danny Dan from down on my from down in Marcy and shit, and uh, a couple bunch of Spanish, old Spanish dudes. I'll, I'll never forget this one Spanish dude named Turbo, big Spanish dude named Turbo. And the reason I won't forget him is because he taught me how to knife fight. Like my uncle had him every day in the back, and man, in the back they had me. He had them teaching me how to, to, to knife fight and the hand fight, you know, combat in preparation for up north. So he, you know, I was always militant because I've learned from being around him. But now that he had me in his, under his direct tutelage, I guess it was like I was his, you know, he, he you know, I, it was like I was, he had his son with him, like a biological son. And he was teaching me the game and everything that I needed to know, like, you know, and, um, like I said, those 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 life lessons, especially with regards to prison, um, helped me a lot. And then, you know, I was an observant dude. I was always on point and paying attention to everything from the street. So I kind of picked up a lot. So I learned a lot. I learned a lot about relationships in terms of men building and bonding with other men. I learned how to, you know what I mean, respect other men. Where you said that kid Turbo was from? I don't know where Turbo was from. Turbo was just a, he could have been from Brooklyn. I don't know. He was just a big diesel, older Hispanic dude. He was older than my uncle because he moved slow. But, and he taught me the knife game, how to knife fight. But he moved slow, but he didn't move slow because when he was teaching me shit and when my young cocky little ass thought I was able to have him and do some shit, he always twisted on me and, 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 ended up fucking me up and showed me how he would have killed me. He's like, yeah, look, if this was a real situation, you would have been dead. If this was a this was a, a lung shot. I'd have collapsed your kidney. I'd have pierced your heart. I'd have put it through your neck. I'm like, yo, bro, all of this? Like, what's really going on up top that I need all of this? But, you know, it you know, it was what it was, man. And uh, I'm I'm forever grateful because again, all of that to me was character building and then at the same time i was in two block with, with with my uncle but like i said after i had that conversation i said yo bro at the end of the day i know you fear for my safety or whatever and and um whatever but but um you, you you're gonna have to let me be me because you know i'm your nephew so the same blood 
runs in my DNA that runs through you. So if you was able to navigate this shit and figure it out and do it and do you, I'm the same type of way. So you're going to have to let me do me and be me. And you know, again, these was older dudes, homie. So what I started doing, I started building me a team of younger dudes and, and, and me and my team of young, yo, we was young, last we was 18. So, you know, we used to play around a lot. We running around the gallery, pretending a knife fight and playing. And yo, Sharif, the homie Sharif that had the big cable and the anchor medallion, he hated young boys. You know them old heads that don't like young boys? That for no reason, I don't care who they are, they always find a reason to yell at you and, and you all said, that. You said this is what year again? 1987 going into 1988 HDM. Hmm. And uh, yeah, Sharif was always yo, 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 knowledge, man. Yo, this is his exact words. We would be playing, doing around horse playing because you know, young boys like to test each other's strength. We'd be in there boxing, fighting, wrestling, playing around, and all that. And Sharif, yo, I swear, he would appear out of nowhere, son. Every time we thought we was having a good time, here comes Sha and Sharif was brown skin, older with glasses and wavy hair from Fort Greene with the big jewels. Anybody that was an HDM back in then, back in 87, 88, no Sharif with the big chain, with the anchor, the glasses and the waves. He would appear out of nowhere, last yelling and screaming, always at the top of his voice. He's like, yo, what the fuck? This man think you're talking to? But I couldn't say that. I would think that in my mind, but I couldn't voice that. I just had to listen. Yo, Fuck these y'all dudes always running around here playing for this shit ain't no game. Niggas get murdered every day. Oh, 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 oh. We gangsters, gangsters don't run around and play. Gangsters is not stop like damn, bro. We gotta be gangsters all the time. We can't. We ain't nobody, ain't no beef. This is the block. We y'all got shit under control. We cool. We no, nah, so yo, bro. Yes. Any time we was out of pocket, I swear this dude popped up like a genie out of nowhere, yelling and screaming. So. Again, all of that discipline would help me later on, you know what I mean? And, and to, even to this day, bro, in life, that, you know, the militancy of, 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 of prison at that time and, and, and some of those encounters and situations um, prepared me and helped me navigate through life was once you, I got out of Was you prison. like that on your last stint? Was you like that if young boys were horse playing around you and all of that? Yeah, yeah, but not to that extent. I, you know, I would basically just drop some jewels, like, yo, homie, like, like. So I'm quite sure you you're gonna come into come into contact with dudes that'll probably call you or reach out to you and be like, yo, homie, I know the dude knowledge and some of them stories that he talking about. I was with him in Elmira, or I was with him in the Cat, or Comstock, or Attica, or Albra, whatever they say. And they'll be like, one of the things the dudes. Or uh, will say about me is that yo he was always kind of like on some militant type shit and all the homies that were in my immediate proximity practice militancy so because because listen in the joint it goes down at any time at any time when you least expect it because you know it's ops and any situation you get into in prison it's all about the win in terms of when dudes is going at it because nobody wants to be on the losing end with a thousand scars on their face or holes in their back or in their neck and or, or don't make it out at all. There was plenty of situations where dudes got into situations and, and died right there on the spot. So again, all of that militancy and training helped. So anybody that I encountered, I, I kept them kind of on that same time that I was on. You couldn't come around me with all that horse playing and shit. So I turned that wow, last. That's funny that you kind of pulled that out of me, bro. Cause I so I see what you're getting at. Yeah, I turned into those dudes, but not to that extent. You know what I mean? I turned into the Sharif and little boxing man and turbo and all that for the younger generation and the younger individuals that I came across. When I went to Kaksaki and Green and all that, and them dudes was younger, I was able to give them you know what I mean? Some of the game and some of the jewels that was given to me because that's what it's about, isn't it, homie? Or that's what it should be about. Each one teach one. So that's how you got me into these conversations that we have now. Say the HDM all the way until the end of 88 or whatever, middle of 88 until I blew trial. I went to trial, got found guilty of trial, got sentenced sometime thereafter, and I went up north um, to, um, went up north from uh, 
from down there. But I came back down to court a couple times. And one of the times that I, because I had a bunch of cases, I told you. And one of the times that I came back down, they always kept me in HDM. So I went back down to HDM and something transpired. When I went back down to HDM, uh, three block, yeah, three block, three block either was always the bing or three block was the bing. Yeah, three block was the bing because when I was in two block, natural was over there, natural for my project was over there in three block and he was in the bing. So one of them times I ended up going to the bing, one of them times I ended up coming back down, I, I think I went up top and came back down from up north. I was in Elmira or whatever, or, or maybe um, Comstock, but I more than likely was in Elmira. I came back down, I was in a bing. Um, Kilo, I think he had to turn a dough. I don't know if he was coming over from because I was old, a little bit older than Tilo, but I was around the same age, a little bit younger than his older brother, Chill. So, um, whatever. Long story short, we in the bank, we in, we in three block bank, HDM. Um, Tilo was in there. I, you know, I, I was in the upper tier. I could look down and see the dudes on the lower tier. I think I may have seen them coming in. Yelled out to him, yo, T Lo. He like, yo, who that? I'm like, yo, Snollis from Sumner, come to the yard tomorrow. So, boom, T Lo came out to the yard and um, we were spinning in the yard. And uh, he had, he didn't have a lot of bank time. So, at some point, he was getting out and going to go to population. Or maybe he wouldn't have went to population. Sometimes they don't keep you in population in the same jail where you're in the at. They might have sent them out. But the whole time he was there and every day, we went out to the yard. I would tell him to come out to the yard and I would spin that little keep lock yard with him and, and drop jewels on him. And um, one of the important things that I told him as it was brought to me and taught to me when I first got there was the importance of like a weapon. Because, you know, he telling me the four building wild war stories and the razors and the cuttings and all that, whatever, maybe how, how he even got to the bay. But I was explaining to him, I'm like, listen, little bro, this is, it's a little bit different over here. Like, you know what I mean? It's, it's grown men in here. Like, and, and they play a little different. And they don't, the little raises and shit, them shit's just gonna get a motherfucker mad. They got big ass knives in here, homie. Street knives. So I said, it's incumbent upon you that whenever you get out of here and go to population to make a knife, or even if you can make something out of where you at here. When I was in age, listen, my thing, I learned from the Spanish dudes, and I'm, this is no cap. I learned from the Spanish dudes how to make knives in HDM, how to make knives and what what constituted the type of material you could use to make a knife. So I learned from the Spanish dudes on how to break anything apart in a cell or whatever, the least smallest thing you could think of to break it apart and make it a, a weapon by sharpening it on the floor add a little water and sharpen it on the floor, wiping it down, sharpen, sharpen, sharpen. So what I told Tila, I, I had made me a banger when I was in there out of a, it was a big ass boat and my, the boat on top of a box or something made my cell was loose. And I kept fucking with it, fucking with it, fucking with it, fucking with it until I eventually was able to pull it loose. And it was probably like a little four and a half inch thick ass boat. And I, I scraped that shit on the floor every day until I got it into a nice, sharp, pointy ice pick joint. And I told Tilo, I said, yo, boy, these cells got, look above your joint, above the door should be a box, like a, you know what I mean? And inside that box is a bolt. If you could loosen that up and get that bolt out, that bolt is gonna make a perfect knife for you, like, you know what I mean? When you go to population, because if you go to population in here, you young, you are, I know you're gonna try to step to the phone or whatever, you gonna need a banger. So for a couple of days, three, four, five days, he was trying, but he couldn't get it out. But anyway, I'm, I'm, I, like I said, I'm giving him the game. We, we catching up because I ain't seen him in years. We, you know, we, we rebuilding our comradeship. And um, um, yeah, he, uh, he was leaving. So, so it finally came the time when he was leaving and shit. He was like, he called up to me because you know, I guess. When you, when you get your property and shit like that, your little bags, whatever you take it, they, give you, they tell you what block you're going to. So he yelled up to me. He like, yo, Nas, I'm going to seven block. So I'm like, okay, seven block. That was one of my old blocks. But the thing was, it was hard. I didn't know who, because populations change over real fast, quickly. So I didn't know who was in seven block at the time. So, you know, 
the only way to get messages out was through the, uh, the feed up dudes. The dudes at the time that was um, coming to serve us the food, they was, uh, you know, uh, uh, they lived in different blocks, but they was just a block worker, you know, in the, uh, in the, in the, in the bay. So he was like, yo, homie, I'm going to seven block. Yo, don't worry about it. I'm good. I love you. Stay up. I can't wait till we get back home. Together, we're going to do crazy things on the streets and all this and all that. And I'm like, all right, bro. I love you, homie. Be safe, little bro. Remember what I told you, bro. Like, when you get there, arm yourself. You know what I mean? And and so, and that was the last time I physically seen him and was able to, you know what I mean, build with my bro and spend time with him and shit. And, um, um, <clears throat> probably like, probably like, maybe like a week, two weeks later, I don't even know, I can't even, I'm not gonna cap and just guess any number, but it was sometime shortly after that, you know, I got word and shit, it, 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 the word came down to me, and um, about what happened to the homie and shit, and you know, that shit crushed me, homie. It was a few things, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't that many things that, back then, that, 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 um, hurt me to my heart you know what I mean especially in a joint in a joint you kind of have to toughen up your heart and harden your heart to you know what I mean everything emotions and all that from what I was taught to to block out the hardships of prison life and to be able to make it out of prison without succumbing to it okay? so it took a lot to navigate through through all this shit last and um like I said, it wasn't a lot, but that was one of the things that, you know, one of the experiences that, 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 um, yes, sir. So yeah, that was one of the experiences that, that, um, that, that crushed me a little bit, man. That shit broke my heart and it, 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 it broke my spirit for for um you know a little a little period of time and shit and um because that was the homie homie like I said um I didn't I didn't meet you know I didn't meet Tilo in jail you know what I mean I didn't you know even though he was from Marcy a couple blocks down from me this was a dude that that I was fucking with when I was on the streets on a daily basis every day running around doing crimes and, and getting money together and, and putting work in together. If they had a situation down there in Marcy, they knew that they could call on us, come up to us and summon or send word and we was coming. You know what I mean? We was coming. Heavy, we was coming. So against whoever, for for, the, for, for certain dudes. And and he was one of those dudes. I mean, so yeah, that, that, that didn't sit well with me and that, and that fucked me up. And, and I took... It, that shit hit me so hard, homie, that for a period of time before I was able to, to get straight, I blamed myself because I was like, <clears throat> I was like, damn, homie, although you weren't there with them and there was nothing you could do to physically prevent it, I felt like that was my little bro. That was a younger brother of mine that I fucked with heavy and he came over to my building, a building where... I ran around for almost a year, some change, almost two years, and made a name for myself. So I felt like even though I was in a thing and I was unable to physically be there, when word got out, like what happened, and they would have been like, and the dudes in the hood would have been like, yo, damn, well, what, how, who was in the building with the homie? And, and if word got out, oh yeah, he was, now, now he was an age damn running around with all that jewelry and doing shit. So he, Hot, you know, so it, that's the type of shit. Even though it didn't have nothing to do with me in terms of me being able to prevent it physically because I wasn't there, I still felt like for a period of time, for a long time, I felt like like I let I I don't know. I mean, it's hard to it's hard to it's hard to put put these type of emotions and in 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 in, 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 in feelings into <clears throat> proper perspective and words. Because it's like, damn, I felt like this is what this is it right here. I felt like I let my little bro down, man. Like, like, like he came on my stomping grounds, and 
and I let him get killed. Even though that's not what happened, that's how I felt, homie. Burr. Yeah, that shit, that shit is heavy, bro. That shit is heavy. Yeah, that was real talk, homie. That's how I felt, man. And and um, you know, that shit, that shit bothered me for 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 a long time because you know, like I said. You see a lot of shit happen. Shit happens in prison, bro. Dudes get killed on a regular basis. Might not be every day, but dudes get killed in in prison all a lot for for various different reasons, homie. But it, it the same way as in the streets. You hear dudes die every day, being all that, but it affects you differently. You dig when it's somebody that's really close to you that you fuck with. You know, you hear about shit, you be like, oh damn, you know, my control system, or whatever. You know, I, I you know. I feel bad or whatever, but when it hits home like that, it's a different type of, it's a dip for me anyway, for me, it was a, it was a different type of pain that, that, you know, I was unfamiliar with. And, you know, back then they say, one of the sayings was that, that I, when I came up remembering was that death came in threes. When I heard that saying, I, I mean, I remember that saying. So when that news came back to me in my mind, I was like, Okay, so you better brace yourself, homie, because there's more to come. If 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 we if we hold it true to the belief or or, or or those ideologies that that you know death comes in pairs or threes or whatever the saying was, I'm like, damn, I just had those bad omens. Like you know, more was to come. I was gonna lose more homies that were close to me, and it was gonna be out of my control. I was not going to be able to, you know what I mean, do anything about it. And and it really burnt me up because I was in the bing. It's not like I, I couldn't put on, you know, I wasn't, I didn't know who did it. You know, you get all of that information later and all that. But, you know, when we came up last, everything was about, and it, it, you know, it's not to say that it was a smart thing or the right thing or whatever, but that's just the way we was living, homie. So I'm only telling you my experiences and, 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 and how we saw things and, and how we reacted to the things we saw. When we came up, homie, death was, was retaliated with by death. So nothing short of death for me was gonna fix that situation. You know what I mean? Right or wrong, people can say whatever they want to say, how they feel about, you know what I mean, whatever I'm saying, but this is this is black knowledge. This is this is this is this is my internalizations and these is my feelings with respect to things. You touch one of mine, I'm touching one of yours, two or three or four of yours. I mean, that's not the right mentality now for the homies younger listening. That that's not the way to go, but that I'm just giving it to you how you know what was on what was on my mind and the thoughts that I had. My thoughts was all murder, homie. All murder, pure murder, nothing short of murder. Like I don't care by any means if I you know, murder. Murder. And um when you can't and that's why this is why I talked to you and when I spoke to you about you know how stresses and 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 and, and all of those type of different energies uh, uh, and negative thoughts and all that eats away at your body and it eats away at your soul and it eats away at your mind because it turns you into a different person homie if you constantly having thoughts of 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 of, of ill will and malicious things and 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 doing harm to people that's that's not a good space to be in, homie. That's not a good space to be in, homie. That's that's not a good space to be in, homie. That's not a good space to be in. But you know, rest in peace to my homie Tilo. And um, yeah, that was my brother. Had a lot of love for him, you know. And um, yeah, yeah. So, yep, there it is, lads. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to take a break, homie, because my shit is like. Aggravated right now. Yeah, HDM is 
different, bro. It's a lot of stories. Like I said, there was a lot of solid men in there. I was in there with a lot of solid dudes, man. And 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 then what I didn't get a chance to say because, you know, I went there with with, with the homie Chilo. But it, what I was gonna say too was, remember I told you that at uh, at one point I told you that um, a lot of times when we was in the streets, right, dudes, I told you that. At one point in time, I wasn't cool with a lot of individuals because we was all breaking, break, you know, uh, uh, building our reputation and and, and 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 breaking bones and doing what we was doing, respectively, in different areas. We may have knew about each other, but we never fucked with each other. Prison forces you to, whether you want to or not, have to interact with people that you may not have necessarily wanted to or would have interacted with in the free world you dig so a lot of those beefs and a lot of those uh, animosities and situations that you have with dudes in the streets if it wasn't a, a, a joint where you know blood was shed and, and and dudes got laid down or whatever then it was always my experiences that when dudes got behind them with the wall those was always situations that allowed dudes an opportunity to get to know each other homie and come together and more times than not i used to find myself saying damn man this shit is crazy homie is all right i thought this nigga was an asshole and nut well, and i was gonna have to blow his head off he probably felt the same way about me but damn when i get so that lets me know that homie our struggles aren't really all that like different homie they not actually we was Poor black and in the ghettos. So, shit, our struggles was the same. We was trying to find a way out and to come up. And I guess we really didn't realize that we wasn't each other fucking enemies, homie. It may have appeared that way and it may have played out those ways through various situations, but that wasn't really what it was. So prison, with respect to those type of experiences and that type of enlightenment, woke me up homie to be like damn if I would have been able to connect with this dude on the outside with our strengths we man we probably could have like I said homie it's a lot of in hindsight man there's a lot of in hindsight but you know I just I, I you know for me I just take the, those all as like life lessons and shit and move it forward those type of insights help me to realize and give me a better perspective of how to deal with people. It's not always on the rah-rah, tough guy, you know what I mean? Because all that does is give you back that same type of energy, take it to the next level, and then cause lives to be lost for a lot of times, no reasons. I mean, we was fighting over hoods and names and respects and all that and property and land that we didn't even own, bro. That, not at all. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, yeah, and the police would come through anytime they want and violate. And we didn't even get into these police stories that I got for you, homie. But they coming. They coming. Police and correction officers stories and all that. Black Rob back in the day said, COs ain't woke. And, you know, a lot of them weren't. I knew a couple maybe in my life of, of going through incarcerations, maybe a handful on one or two hands, the most that was I, you know what I mean? But, you know, for the most part, man, that 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 shift in, in power where you give power over someone else's life into somebody and without, you know, knowing whether or not they psychologically able to or ready to accept that type of responsibility and take on those type of roles, you get disasters on me you get the type of disasters and fiascos that we've been seeing since you know i mean i can remember really being aware and cognizant of everything with respect to you know i mean the shit you go through with with the boys and all that but you know again those are different episodes different situations we're going to talk about we're going to keep it on this this other energy this street energy shit whatever until we shift it because we got i gotta get all that out of my system first before i could talk about the transitions and the changes you know what i mean i gotta let them see what type of animal and out of control individual i was before i you know 
was able to get cultivated and schooled and all that. Like I said, homie, this shit is a journey, man. And um, right, this shit is a journey, homie. Hey yo, LAZ, if you not watching the Sumner series, you not watching the best new series on YouTube. You missing some of the best hood stories on YouTube. Some of the best Rikers Island stories on YouTube. Some of the best jail stories that you gonna hear. You gonna miss all that. If you lacking like that and you ain't watching this new series, shout out to the Brooklyn legend, Black Knowledge, one of the most legendary Brooklyn figures that ever walked Brooklyn soil. Shout out to the whole Sumner Projects, the whole bed the whole Tompkins, the whole Roosevelt, the whole Bushwick, the whole Marcy. Whoever I'm forgetting, leave it in the comments. Let me know what part of Brooklyn you rep. If you from that bed star, I need you to rep extra hard in them comments. And let me know what block or what projects in bed star you from and what you repping. You heard? Z-Man, Suicide Polo with the Ski Man running around the hood like He-Man. We see a, a Spanish dude come running up the lane from behind him. He was literally chasing the bike. What then you know, man? He pulls me wow. That could keep up with a dirt bike. Like, boy, come on. But he was, you know, several paces behind, but he was still coming. But disrespectfully letting that hammer go. And the hammer, the bullets was striking poles and fences. We hearing the shit. Where's the bomb? Because he's riding past up. So we now we all ducking and. Who was the hierarchy in some of the projects before you really had it? Right, so <clears throat> um, back then, there's so many dudes to name, homie, but actually it would have been the dudes that was before me, the generations or whatever, a generation or two, whatever, that was before me, the dudes like, um, you know, rest in peace, homie, Big Strap. Uh, Strap was from my building. A man, um, Zaquan, Zaquan was from my building. He had an older brother named Pep. His name was Lenny, Lenny and Pep. Um, Shaheed, Shaheed was like from Sumner, kind of like Marcy, whatever, but he was from the back of my building. Um, he, you know, rest in peace, Shaheed too as well. But them dudes that had it before me would have been the, um, definitely before us, the generation that we like closely mimic would have been the, um, uh, the Nils is that's the other knowledge and uh, and his brothers uh I God and, and, and the younger brother Hicks call him Hicky Do Man Natural and um you know the cat you know Shannon before you know his situations or whatever went left and um couple couple more notable dudes so with them dudes right so to give you a little backdrop of the history so Coming up then, watching all of the some of the older dudes that I mentioned, we was the younger dudes, us, myself in particular, learning the game from them. I was, you know, I was watching them dudes. I would watch them, watch how they moved, watch how they interacted around the projects, see how they dealt with people that wasn't from the projects, and then, you know, whatever information that they spit to me, whatever game they personally gave to me when I was around them, you know, I learned from all of that. But the one of the wildest dudes that I remember. That was older, like one of the toughest dudes that, that that I can recall from my own eyesight, seeing him lay his gangster down was this dude named Shahi. One of the dudes that I mentioned that was um that, that passed away. Sh Shahi was a Muslim dude. So I remember now last we gonna really get back into some deep history. Now I told you I moved to Sumner when I was like four or five. So I couldn't have been much more older than that. I had to have been maybe eight or nine, maybe probably 10, the oldest, if that. So 
the way the projects is, is um, situated, you know, in front of each building, they have usually have like a little, well, on my side anyway, the Park Ave side. Shout out to Park Ave, something. Y'all know what it is. But um, on my side, we had buildings like my building, the building in front of my building that had a little grass area before they started changing it up. And in that little grass area, <clears throat> dudes used to play football. So this is where we started building up some of our toughness. We, we used to play the, the older dudes, how to playing tackle football. None of that two-hand touch shit. We no, we have no equipment. Get that football ball, you better keep it moving. Because <laughs> when they catch you, they pile it on you. So we playing football one day, and I'll never forget this. It was an older dude from my building named uh, Robert. I think his name was Robert Nolan. I think he had a brother named Boo Boo Nolan. Boo Boo Nolan was this big athletic dude that was nice in a lot of sports. So it was them, I think the cat Shaheed, a couple other cats from the builders, you no know, connecting builders. We was playing each other. And um so we playing a football game. We running, we tackling, whatever, whatever. So if some dudes on Park Avenue coming up past some of the projects, like two or three dudes, they was I don't know. I didn't think they were doing anything wrong. They was just walking through, you know, walking up the projects, not even necessarily through the projects, because they was on Park Avenue. They was coming up the block. So let me just quickly, briefly give you the synopsis of the way we see Sumner. So Sumner consists of of uh, Park Avenue, right? From Let's say if you start down from Troop Avenue, going up to like Lewis, and then from Lewis Avenue, going up to Myrtle, then from Myrtle Avenue, coming all the way back down to Troop. That's what we consider Sumner projects. Got across the street, 303, they're part of Sumner too, but growing up, they weren't necessarily considered some of the project dudes because, you know, they didn't, they was kind of did their own thing. They never, there was a part of something, but they never really interacted with the project dudes like that. But anyway, getting back to the story with the dude, Shahi and, and the three dudes. So we playing football. I'm like, couldn't have been seven, eight, nine, something like that. They playing. So I, all I remember is him, dude, Shahi said, hey, yo, hold up, hold up, hold up one second. So everybody stopped to see what the hold up was about. He said, hold up, hold up one second in the middle of the game. So he started walking towards towards Park Avenue, towards where, you know, right in the grass area, towards where the three dudes was walking up at. And he stopped him, like, yo, 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 hold up, hold up. Y'all dudes, hold up. So I'm like, I'm following behind, you know, little kid nosy and shit. I'm following behind to see to see what the fuck was going on. I'm like, what's what happened? So everybody else confused too. So he like, yo, yo, this is no cap. Um, as anything I tell you is not going to be no cap I'm telling you vividly and directly from my own memory and from my own experiences no fabrications or embellishments or nothing but Shahi stopped them three dudes he said hey yo what the fuck are y'all doing walking through my projects like y'all niggas is tough Diddy bopping with ice grills and all that y'all looking over here at us like, like y'all want some like y'all want to do something Yo, this is the one I'm t- I never First of all, I've never seen nothing like this before Number one He was by himself Even though all of us was here He told us hold up And walked off by himself He didn't look back To see if anybody was following him or nothing This was him Of his own accord Pressing three dudes That was walking through the projects And again, last From my observation I don't know if he had beef with them Whatever, whatever But from my observation They wasn't doing nothing Simply or it's nothing other than simply walking up the aisle along the side of the project. But the dude Shahid, he, I guess he didn't like the look on their faces as they was walking through the projects for, like, I don't even remember if they had a, you know, at home, you know, most black people have a ditty bop or swag that they wore. Some dudes emphasize a little more with the tough guy shit, but I, I, I don't recall none of that. My young man, I don't recall none of that. I just recall him walking through the piece and he pressed them like, you know, fuck y'all don't walk through here. Y'all don't walk through here like y'all talk. You stand up straight, walk regular, and don't make no eye contact with nobody in there. And let's try this like, what the fuck? What kind of shit was that? So when he did all of that, said all that, and then he came back to us, the older dudes was like, yo, Shahi, what you doing? He's like, fuck all that. Don't nobody be coming through Sumner, walking like they tough and all that. This our hood. So, so, bro, right then, from that experience, right then and there, that was my first encounter with okay I guess this is how you spoil the rep for your hood when you rep in your hood when you rep in your little projects or whatever don't nobody supposed to come through here 
even with the appearance of disrespect. Even if they're not saying nothing, nothing, you're not supposed to be coming through here walking like you crazy hard or walking like you crazy tough. If you did, niggas just press me. So, okay, so boom, that was that. That was my introduction. That's what I got from that. So now, you know, so moving forward, um, from there, I'm like, okay, and then I told you about some of the stories where, where you know, dudes was getting the hammers and all that and putting in the work. But so from the Shahi dude that I was mentioning, and then to the to the to the Hickey dudes and the Agars and the Nilsers and 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 the, and the lights, those dudes was putting off for the projects. Like dudes, my man Gordy and them from Eight Away, Duke Warren, all them dudes and dudes up the hill from us, Alby Al, Henny Hen, Quali and all them. I would see these dudes that was a couple generations older than me constantly in situations. Man, Wayno from 824, David Parker, these dudes run around robbing people and they was running around shooting up the projects. Again, that wasn't a good thing. Necessarily it wasn't a good or bad thing back then. It just was what it was. I didn't look at it like a good or bad thing. I just looked at it like, okay, information. This is what dudes is doing. You know, I... Yes, but I don't know. This is I'm assuming this is how we're supposed to put on. So again, I'm watching these dudes. So them dudes that have the projects, they they put on. But and, and we, the, my peer group the, of individuals that I was fucking with, as we growing up watching these dudes, we watch them and we learning from their mistakes and their errors and shit like that. So we figuring out for ourselves. All right, when it's our turn, this is how we gonna do it. So all them dudes that I mentioned or whatever that put on for something and all that. They definitely put on even the dudes from the other half, the Tommy Two Tucks, VLs, and all of those that was over there, the uh, uh, Powerfuls, and all of those, the Goosey Loves that was putting on. All of those put on. Dudes put on for something lovely. It's no, no dispute in that. But from my perspective, right, and you know this is this will be subject to debate. But from my perspective, nobody put on in summer the way we put on. When I say we, I mean my generation of dudes because again we learned from the dudes before us and then it was you know a couple of dudes with some hands on their shoulders and was like all right we get our opportunity to shine this is what we're doing and so when we got our opportunity to shine we did everything we saw them doing plus some so we upped it everything we saw them doing and some of the things that we saw that they could have did differently and did better, we made sure that we did it differently and did it better. So that's how our name, my generation of dudes, cast names started resonating. And all the older dudes that's still around that didn't pass away, when they went up north and heard about us and they came home, they, they always give our team of dudes the, the respect because they said, yo, they did their thing. But they was like, yo, boy, nobody put on like y'all dudes did. Y'all really repped for the hood. And, 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 and y'all really put on so you know I always take that like alright I mean good bad and different ugly whatever man like I said it was what it was and then you know with it being that everything that we did was always about putting on so those dudes that I mentioned was the dudes that had the projects before me and before my team of individuals that was doing their little thing, putting their little work, robberies, man downs, whatever they was doing. And then, you know, we came into play. And when we came into play, it was just a little bit different, huh? When did it come to a point where, where people or you could actually say, yo, I run Sumner, or my people's run <laughs> Sumner, or my team run Sumner? Yeah, you put smiles on my face last because I got to give you, you know, your, your flowers on your journalistic skills with the questions and shit because a lot of stuff I forget, but then the way you word the questions will bring me right there. All right, so for me, so look, this is how I look at it, homie. For everybody that put on respectively in their hearts, right, the way I viewed it was you have to have the support in the backing of your hood when you're putting on for said hood, right? Because a lot of times, you know, you have, you know, older people when you're doing wild shit, they're quick to call the cops on you or quick to sick the man on you or whatever, whatever, quick to run to your parents and always say, you know, a lot of negative shit about you. So a lot of times, the way we did shit, we always 
wanted to get the respect from the elders, so that's why we gave them respect. Not just the elders in terms of the dudes, but the, the women, bro, the older black women in our products. We knew we was running around violating and putting people's lives in jeopardy and shit like that. So we tried to, 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 to counter that by doing positive shit. So now, how my, how I got to know that, yeah, something was mine, was, I'll never forget. An a, a, a incident, we was, it had to have been like around the I don't know, around the 4th of July or something like that. Whatever it was, it, it, if it wasn't the 4th of July, it was something close to one of those holidays. It was hot outside. This had to have been like 85, 86, 1985, 86. What could have been before that? Whoever fact uh, checkers, get in the comments. Let me know what year I'm talking about. But, but, but the people of Sumner that remember this incident, this is how Sumner came into my possession. We was in, we was, we was down by 808, building called 808, uh, that's adjacent to or behind uh, the public school PS59, sitting on the benches. It's myself, it's my comrades, uh, it's, it's uh, uh, Hash, a couple other dudes, Weebo, Tim, Hunt, we all on the bench, bunch of us, some of the dudes, bunch of some of the dudes. And we, and back then, we used to steal uh, bikes, dirt bikes, them KLRs and them XL 350s and all that. My man that I told you about before, Charlie Knowledge B, he was a bike fanatic enthusiast and a bike thief. So he taught us how to steal bikes. So we would always go to different hoods, take the bikes, and then we would be bring the bikes back to our private treat it like this hours, wash it, and all that wild <laughs> shit. Street. Listen, we treated everything stolen, homie, like it was ours. Cars that we stole, we had in the Yo, we had about 15, 20 stolies in the parking lot at some point, and my whole watch was just and everything like, like they was ours. I don't know we was out of control. But back to the story, we had some stolen bikes. So uh, God bless the dad, the homie Raleigh. Raleigh was um, Knowledge B, older brother. Raleigh was one of my big older heads and one of my men that I that I loved as a kid who brought up because Raleigh was this real this kind of short dude, like maybe like Kevin Hart, a little bit taller than Kevin Hart height, but his heart was his heart was phenomenal and he was a, a gangster from you know his era of old dudes the way he would put on so he didn't necessarily know how to rob bikes but he used to like him to rob bikes so either he had came home from either DFR or one of them up north bins and we was all in a project with stolen bikes so Raleigh got on the bike I let Raleigh take my bike and uh, H my, my uh, one of my homies H my crimey H he was on another bike so H and I think Weibo went riding off somewhere uh, Raleigh went riding off somewhere so on the bench on the bench by the eight donors a bunch of us like maybe 10, 15 of them. So like half an hour go by, we sitting there, we just chopping it up, talking war stories. Mind you, I told you, I believe it was the 4th of July or something like that because to my right, to, directly to my right of the lane of benches that we were sitting on about eight way is the park, like 59 Park, a park with swings and rods for kids, sliding boards and all that stuff. I think that the kids from public school, when they would recess, they would recess into that little public project park and play. So, but it wasn't school time. This was in the summertime. So it's everybody out there. I, it's people out there grilling. I remember people out there grilling. It was people out there grilling, cooking. I think the dude that from my building I was talking about, Robert Nolan, or Boogie and them, they was there. I know Robert was there, grilling. Dude, Donnie from 824, another older dude, Foots, my man Foots from 808, and all of the older dudes, they was there grilling. So we all sitting down, music playing, we chilling. We hear music like that, and then we hear mad shots. So I'm like, oh shit. So, you know, everybody jumped up. So now we in the projects, we ain't even got our hammers on, it's like that. We was playing, but we wasn't playing to, we was playing, but not all the way, all the way, all the way like that. We were still building the name, but we were still playing. But I didn't have my ham on me, but my building was the closest. Hash didn't have his ham on him. Hash building was behind mine, across the street or something to have side. So we hit the gunshots fire. Bah, 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 bah. My man, H, he riding up, up, up from Park Ave, up the lane, on the bike, flying. And I guess my man, Weebo, was on the back. We both jumps off the back of the bike, runs into the building, and and, and H, he's he he maneuvers the bike around to where we at, to cut back through the park to get away from, you know what I mean, the gunshots. We didn't know, but the gunshots was at him. So now it's we see a, a Spanish dude come running up the lane from behind him. He was literally chasing the bike. What well, thing you know, last these dudes be wild. That could keep up with a dirt bike. Like, boy, come on. But he 
was, you know, several paces behind, but he was still coming. But disrespectfully letting that hammer go. And the hammer, the bullets was striking poles and fences. We hearing the shit, where's the bomb? Because we riding back up. So we now we all ducking in the run mode, you know what I mean? Just to ascertain what's going on before we... You know what I mean? Go take off and get the things. We got to see where the threat coming from. So, boom, he came running past the acre. It's Puerto Rican cat from Tongas named uh, 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 Jeff, white boy. He, he looked white, but I think he spoke Spanish. But he was he was a well-known gun buster and a hitter on, on the Latino tip from, from Tongas from Tongas Projects. Uh, uh, white boy Jeff is what we called him. So... He came running through, busting the hammer. So now, mind you, we all running, right? So he, you know, he had us. Because he came running straight, not the wrestle. Because my man H rolled the bike past him. So he back, he got the hammer, waving the hammer back and forth. And everybody like, and, but he knew my man Hash. They went to school together. He used to call my man Hash uh, uh, Harry. So he like, so we, you know what I mean? We looking like, yo, boy, what you doing? And he waved the gun, yo, Harry, yo, let the motherfuckers know they riding bikes and crashing the people disrespect while I play that I'm a murderer those always was giving speeches back then I don't understand all that like like so I'm we all stand there listening but we got our hands like all right boy you right you got it right you a the right niggas about all right do you think that so and then he said what he said he walked off through the park as soon as he walked off last through that park it looked like a, a rat race maze to the hammers it was we was off. We had a little hole in the fence. Hash cut through the fence because he could cut through another part of the fence to take him to his building quicker. But like I said, my building was first. So when I turned that bend, I'm top speeding it to my crib to get the joint. The joint that I had at that time was the four fifth. And I traded that because I didn't like that because it kept jamming. I had the blue steel four fifth, like nine shots. Had that in a stash in the crib. So now, mind you, like I said, you had to get to support from the people in the projects for you to do certain shit. This was broad daylight now because I told you it was cookouts, people cooking out, eating, whatever, whatever. I'm running through the projects. The people in my projects that know me, like the older ladies or whatever, whatever, that heard the gunshots that was ducking. It was a summer day. Everybody was outside. They see me running to my building. They already know what it's hitting for because they've seen that scene several occasions. Me running to the building, but my brother running to the building. We're going to get them things coming back out and it get crazy. So I ran to the building. I ran in the crib. I got the four fifth. Now I'm running back to where the where the where this incident transpired where son came busting through with the hammer disrespectfully violating. So now I'm running back in that direction. I'll never forget it was this lady from 824, the building across from us. Her name was Dina. She lived on the first floor. Her and my mom's had lady beef from back in the day so they never really liked each other so they just kept their distancing and I didn't like them because my moms didn't like them and they probably didn't like me because my moms didn't like them or whatever but this same lady Dina when she seen me run in the crib and run back out the crib she grown ass woman now so old grown ass woman she said Joe make sure you go get whoever that was so okay now I'm really hyped I'm like oh the support right from somebody that I didn't even thought liked me. So I'm like, all right, boom. Now I'm running back to the fence to where we came from. And as I'm running back over there, at the same time, my man Raleigh that had my bike, well, it wasn't my bike, I stole it, but it was still my shit. He had my bike, he came back, he had a flat and he was pushing it. He seen me running back through 59, through the park. And he stopped, he said, yo, go through the backside. He said, nah, let's go through the backside. He's still right there. He's right there in, in, Front of uh, Tonkin's projects or some of the projects on Troop Avenue. He said he right there, get him. So I, I crept through the back and and I and popped out of the So now the whole scene that made me remember everything so vividly is that as I was creeping on the side of the building to pop out on him from behind, you know, 59, it's the way you can come through. And when you pop out, instead of being in a big part of the park, you were in a little lane. That little lane right where I popped out at, when I popped, before I popped out, I saw to my left, slowly in slow motion, because everything happened for me in slow motion every time I was about to really, really get crazy. So in slow motion, I see the dude, Robert Nolan, Donnie, Foots, and a couple of older, other older black women arguing with the dude 
in the he was sitting in the car. It was another Spanish dude driving. He was in the passenger seat, and he had his head out. The, you know, the window was rolled down, and he was arguing, and he was arguing with them like whatever. From my recollection, I think. And I believe that the people from my project was like, yo, why would you come through here shooting? It's all of these kids out here. You could have hit a kid, whatever, whatever they were saying. And he was, you know, on his tough guy shit, voicing his opinion, saying back what he was saying. So when I came from behind the, behind the wall and popped out from the side of 59, the dude, Robert, saw me out the corner of his eye because I it was like a blur when I just came out right into the middle of the street. Where he was on the sidewalk talking to the dude when I came out to the middle of the street, my you know, that thing was, you know, coming up and Rob seen me, he even if he I don't even know because it was slow motion, even if he was telling me, yo, no chill, there was no well, no chill once the thing started going up. So when that you know, when I raised that thing and I was, I was already firing from when I popped out and before I even got to the street. And when I was taught to put the pain in, we was always taught, you know, to hawk shit down. Like, you know what I mean? Don't shoot from a distance and behind, behind shit. No, hawk shit down, meaning run at your prey like a lion chasing a deer or something until you catch it. You don't, you know, so I'm running at him shooting. Top speed with my little young speed with the fourth fifth. That whole shit was ringing, lads, ringing. Now, the window started shouting. I wasn't, again, I wasn't the best aim. So he was talking and shit, and I was already running and aggravating and shooting with the adrenaline. So when I started shooting at him and the bus the windows out, he immediately ducked. He immediately ducked in the car, and I didn't think to shoot through the doors. Now I'm all it's all head action for us. So we head hunting. So I'm shooting for heads, and the dude that was driving ducked down and and, and shot the car down the ab down Troop Ave and I'm running down the middle of the street behind Troop Ave chasing the car letting that thing go I let about four or five more go on that joint and then came back walking the same way that I came from and back into the project now when I this was the thing for me that's when I knew I had it when I walked back into that project last and this is no cap everybody that can remember the story is going to test to it when I walked back into that project last it was about Hundred people, kids, grown people, older dudes, and my kids standing there clapping. I'm like, yeah. I was like, what the fuck? And so that was my first taste of okay. If you, I guess, if you're doing something for the for the for the hood and you're doing it right, you are gonna get the accolades and the praise. So from that incident right there, I guess everybody in the hood of Sumner, in the projects of Sumner that was out that day respected me as one of the individuals that they knew that was going to put on for the hood. Like, that, whoever that was, he wasn't from my project. He came through shooting disrespectful kids and it's still disrespectful when people trying to check him and all that and that nobody had a gun though, which was weird to me. Like, y'all dudes doing all that talking, fuck all that talking. He didn't come through talking. My thing was, and, and I think in some of the last was, we do the same shit that other people do and we try to do it better than they do. So if you come through my shit with your gun rolling, what the, what am I talking to you about, homie? You already made your statement. <laughs> you know what I mean? Your statement spoke loud and clear. So, okay. If, if we don't get put down and we got an opportunity to, go, to, to get even, we we going to get them things and we coming back to answer your statement. Our thing was all, all call outs were mandatory. So that was a call out. If you come through somebody hood busting, you calling everybody in there out because you randomly busting at everybody. So we accepted the call out. I stood there. Has, my man has, like I said, by the time he got ran to get his gun and he lived on the seventh floor running up the stairs and then man by the time he did all that the smoke was already clear I was already coming back through the projects receiving the accolades the cheers the pat on the shoulders and, and then the dude around the dolan that was from my building they didn't even know I was you know we kept shit quiet certain, to a certain extent he didn't know that I you know that I was playing with the pistols like that so I guess in his eyes like oh damn the little homie from the building on the first floor he, he put me on. So from that incident on, I was, you know, recognized that, okay, something that's me. Because I was going to be one of the, throughout the history of it, I was always going to be one of the main characters 
of one of the main individuals, whenever there was a problem, put my life on the line and, 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 and you know what I mean, Bang, banging out for the hood. You know, so yeah, that was a, and the wild shit was my man that was getting chased, <laughs> that was getting chased on the bike. And shit getting shot at he he shot back shot across the street in time because he said he threw the bike and ran up the stairs and, and, and went all the way to the roof and was and, and was on the roof chilling. I don't know what that was back then, lad. That was our shit. When we was on the takeoff, we would go up to the roof and or go across the roof or whatever and, and look down and see what the fuck was going on. But he said he went up to the roof and he heard the shots and he didn't know what was going on. But when he came down, you know, we, we told him whatever and um like I said, I got my props for that. And boy, you know, boy came back to do uh, uh, White Boy Jeff because, like I said, he was a solid dude. He came back trying to um, trying to answer our answer to what he did. So you know, it was, it was a little back and forth shit, a couple times and shit. And I was, but, but but the funny shit was like, you know, some older dudes intervened, actually strapped my man. To me. So here the wild shit is strap. God bless that strap is the brother, the older brother. On the dual eights that I'm telling you about that was on the bike. So Strap, when Strap heard about dudes trying to kill his brother, and then he heard about me putting on, so he one day we in front of my building and shit, and the, and the dude, same dude, Jeff, come back. He didn't, I don't think he necessarily knew it was me that was shooting at him, or if he did, you know what I mean? He he kept it vague or whatever, but he knew it was a, a little Boston dude, a little black dude or whatever, whatever. So I probably fit the description of dudes. Like I said, they was looking for dudes or whatever. Supposedly me, from what everybody was telling me, like, oh, you shot them, whatever, you almost killed me, whatever, and and I didn't hit none of them. The crazy, that was the crazy shit. And that was where one of some of my old heads was like, yeah, homie, you going to the shooting range because you, that was point blank range. You chasing the car and all that, there should have been blood everywhere. Everything happens the way it's supposed to happen, homie. I'm a firm believer of that. So that shit didn't play out on a on a man down situation because it wasn't in the cars for it to go that way yet. I still had reputation for build and I still had work to put in. I still had shit to learn. But, you know, because if it would have went the man down situation and both of them would have been down, then I would have probably never got to be knowledge of all of the accumulated situations. Probably just from that little one isolated incident. But dudes wouldn't have gotten to see my my body of work. That's a fact. You know what I mean? And what's and what's even crazier about that is how old was you when you said that happened? That ha- when that happened, I was like 15. All right, so let's say you would have man down both of them or somebody at 15. Like, real talk, you might have went to the can for about the next 15 years because you was under 16 at the time. But it's like, do you, it's a hundred niggas in the penitentiary right now that they was repping for they hood like that. And they got, they caught, they came out the house, caught a body immediately for the hood. And niggas went up in the mountains for 15, 20 years and the whole hood done forgot about them niggas. And when they come home, they come home like, yeah, I repped, I put on for the hood. They come home, niggas don't even know who them niggas are. Yeah. And, and, and what's even crazier is like, bro, you was dropping jewels because what a lot of people may not understand about the ghetto, if they never lived in the ghetto or the hood or whatever, is a lot of dudes who became killers, a lot of dudes who was busting a gun, they started off defending their hood from reckless, from reckless bullies from another hood. You feel me? And the love that dudes received from defending their hood it's like the community was scared the community was scared of the of of dudes that come through and rob and shoot and kill and do what they do and the, at the time the community couldn't depend on the police to to protect the hood from the type of shit that was going on at two in the morning and broad daylights and all of that. So the community began to rely on the thugs, the thugs from the hood to, to basically police the hood and keep them safe. (laughs) You feel me? So a lot of gangsters and shooters, their their origins came from protecting their own community from psychotic killers. That's a fact. 
You feel me? And and niggas got sucked into the game. And when they got sucked into the game, they started realizing that they was in the streets. Now they need to eat. So they got sucked into getting money in the streets. And it didn't really, it wasn't really planned that way. And it's crazy because if we was living in medieval times, what these gangsters and shooters would be is knights in shining armor. Talk heavy, homie. Knights in shining armor. That protected their community and their town or their village from invaders. Because it's not a lot of people that's going to put their life on the line and their freedom on the line for their community. And that's what a lot of dudes did. Not every dude. Some dudes in our hoods, they took advantage of their own hood. That's a fact. Some niggas was bad apples. You understand? But there was other dudes that... They just wasn't trying to hear that reckless shit in they hood. You understand? So it was crazy. And even that nigga who came shooting at the at your bro on the bike, he probably felt niggas was vi- dangerously violating his hood. Like he said. Actually, you are 100% correct in your analysis of that, homie. What his argument was was that my homie was robbed the bike through the projects recklessly and fucked into him or banged him with the bike. And, and kept it moving But I'm saying a part me or nothing So like I said He was a dude Probably been in and out of jail He had a little Reputation in the hood Amongst the blacks And the Hispanics Of a, being a gun buster And a tough guy So uh, you know, So imagine that Right You think you running the hood Or, or you repping And your name resonates Somebody comes Racing through Disrespectfully on a bike Probably ice from you Banging to you Don't show you no respect Don't say part me A lot of dudes die For disrespectful Acts on what people perceive the disrespectful acts. If it would have been like, wait, that was, and that was one another. That was one of the conversations that I had with my homie Ace afterwards. And I said, damn, homie, you know, boy was a, was a wild dude. If you banged into him, you could have at least said, pardon me. In this whole situation, what it came about, his response was he didn't even recall bumping into that dude. He could have said because you know, riding wild and fast. And again, last we were reckless and and. In the point where we were, because we were cocky and confident. It was a regular bike. No, a stolen bike. Uh, uh, one of them XL. It was an XL Brown 125. He had the Brown yeah. XL 125. Even riding a motorbike through a nigga hood will cause problems. Facts. We, we, it's just we it's too gangster. A motor, a dirt bike is too gangster. When you ride a dirt bike through a nigga hood, a nigga gonna feel a certain kind of way. Especially if you're not from his hood and he don't fuck with you like that. that that's that's a whole fact, homie. That's a whole fact. And, and and we got stories. So that's how some of the beefs got between my team of dudes and some of the and the older dudes from Marcy that you know what I mean that we that we cool fuck with now. Like shout out to my homie Hal Val and Stan and all of those from the notion side on that and uh of uh, uh, Marcy that was put on and they didn't like the fact that you know, they was in jail, and when they came home from jail, like I said, we had hooked up with the loves and the T-Lows and the Tatas and all that from Marcy, and we was a group of young dudes recklessly doing our thing, riding bikes, and, and Marcy's big. Marcy's like the, you know, Marcy, you could drive through Marcy because Marcy's set up that way to, you know, for cars to drive through the actual project. So we used to, and to remember, everything we had was stolen. So, but we treated it like it was ours. So we would take our stolen bikes and stolen cars and be racing through Marcy, chasing each other, trying to knock each other off the bike with the stolen cars, kicking the cars on the bikes and racing, just violating. And I know them dudes was like, yo, you know what I mean? Rightfully so. But some of these dudes coming through and they're not even from Marcy. So I get it. I get it. I didn't get it back then. It was, it was on and it was popping. Because I didn't get it. I understand that. And then, you know, that came. And I didn't look at it as like, I was I was really necessarily putting on and protected from my home because I didn't have the concept and the understanding of all that at 15, 16. All I was responding to was the disrespect. You coming through shooting and then you shooting at my head? Sir, we got to get to that. So, you know, that's, that's how that came about. But what you said was correct about how dudes were revered for standing up and representing their heart. And some of the bro, right? So in some of the, when I go through the history, because it's all, you know, spread it out, but it'll come together, you know, when we first started coming up, 
together. It was a group of dudes like it was myself, my brother, my brother name is Poison. Everybody know Black Knowledge, they know Black Knowledge and Poison. They yeah, I see somebody poison. left a comment and said, Is this the same Black Knowledge who got a brother named Poison? Oh what? Yeah, somebody said that in the comments. Oh, so you know I don't read the comments for your for your advice. I don't really read the comments and shit. But okay, so yeah, whoever that was, probably they know. Yeah, but that's a fact. My little bro name is Poison and shit. So prior to us, you know, individual I mean, becoming the group, we was in like little pockets of packets of uh uh of uh, uh, dudes that, you know, got busy and then we all came together as one whole some of the projects. But from my building it was myself. My brother, uh, Poise, upstairs was my man H, the same dude, H, and I was telling you about that, I was on a bike, my man Shah, and his brother Bob, a couple other dudes, notable cats, I'm gonna get to them, some of them later, the older dudes, the Spanish dudes and all that, not a notable cat, but we used to run around calling ourselves, uh, Poison Clan, like, cause my brother's name was Poison and shit, and, you know, his little clan was called the Poison Clan and shit, him, H, uh, Hunt, Hunt, brother Hash, and all them, you know, they was like the little poison clan. That's what we used to call them, the poison clan. And I had my group of dudes, me, myself, Knowledge B, whoever, my man Joe from Bushwick and all that. Um, yeah, we, go, def- we gotta get back to the Bushwick dudes too because they definitely put on, there's some cats in there that definitely, definitely put on and I don't wanna make it seem like I, we didn't fuck with Bushwick. I had some homies from, in Bushwick too that definitely was putting on, so it was definitely some Bushwick cats that was putting on. We'll get back to that. Part and self, rest in peace, my bro, Majesty Mel from Bushwick Projects that recently passed away. It's my bro, I love you, my bro. Know what I mean? But yeah, my fault. Respect, respect, definitely respect. Always give respect where respect is due. So I said it was the little poison clan then, whatever. And then we, we graduated and, and changed our name. We, came, we became the brothers. And what I said was, tipping my hat to all of the Brooklyn gangsters and the cats that came up respectively in their hoods, putting on. But, you know, I want to correct a little bit of you know, Brooklyn history at some point I heard or somebody brought brought it to my attention that some, you know, individuals outside of some that was like kind of like referring to themselves as the brothers. So let me correct history. The brothers came from some of the projects, right? So they were the, the original, you know, brothers, a group of brothers was from some of the projects. And the reason they called us the brothers, we actually got the, the name the brothers from a chick, uh, not a chick, from a, a, a woman that I refer to, like my sister, she named Tiffany, Tiffany, Tiffany from the projects, um, and and it was this girl named Novell from Boston. I always thought she was from Tonkin, but I recently found out she was actually from Boston. But Tiffany and her little girl crew, and, and from Tonkins and Novell and all that from Boston, had a deep little clique of girls or whatever. And they would always hang out in my projects and some of them, and they would always um, see us walking through on our various missions to do whatever we wanted or were about to do and they would always Tiffany would always be saying like yeah there go my brothers right there like you know they're about to do something they look like they have something when them brothers start you know you see them brothers walking around with that certain look you better get ready to run because it's about to go down so uh, Tiffany consistently and constantly referred to us as her brothers the brothers that name stuck with us because Novell and them they was from Mars they didn't really know us they were getting to them. so I guess when they went back down telling these stories all these dudes from some oh what's their name I don't know they just called them the brothers so that's where we got the name from the brothers so if anybody else was 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 claiming the brothers and they was affiliated with us or whatever that's cool but if you weren't affiliated with us and you were saying y'all was the brothers that's not actual Brooklyn history the brothers came from some of the projects and I'm going to tell you some of the reasons why we just called the brothers. So now, as you mentioned, how dudes respectfully put off of their hood the, and, you know, don't allow dudes to come through the hood, violate, disrespect, whatever, whatever. There were several incidences where dudes would come from different hoods, right, into into some of them to see the girls because that's what dudes do. You know, sometimes dudes don't mess with the girls from their own hoods or when they do, they get older, they graduate from the girls in their own hoods and they start exploring other hoods. Because we always, I, me personally, I always thought that Bushwick Projects, Marcy Projects, I always thought they had the girls, like, right? you know what I mean? So we was always at that age, wherever the girls were. But anyway, dudes probably felt the same way about some of them. Dudes from other hoods probably felt the same way about you know, some of the girls that were in Sumner 
the prettier girls, and they was coming through checking. So it was a couple instances, I guess, where dudes, I guess, probably stepped out of line or whatever, and they like, so now I tell you, at this point, I got the hook. My team of dudes, we got the hook. So we getting little, little snippets of different stories from dudes like, yo, yeah, dudes came through to see such and such, and they was violating it. Or this dude had a hammer, and all sorts of wild shit. So now, whenever we hear a shit, we going to seek out these stories because I told you we had the hood, so we was regulating and repping for the hood. So we wanted to hear the stories from the individuals that were possibly, you know, victims of whatever. So we hearing all these stories. So I'm like, all right. So okay, so niggas coming through here, they doing too much, and they coming to see these girls, and they violating. So had to have a long conversation. You know what I mean with the girls from my hood, Tiffany's and our little crew. Like, listen. And then I told them, I said, yo. So what we doing? What, what my homies doing? We implementing curfew. Sumner had a curfew and the curfew started at 8 o'clock sharp and I'm going to tell you one incident where we gave a dude until 8.30 you know we just on the strength of being connected whatever with my people or whatever we gave you know we kind of like gave him a pass he'll remember but anyway 8 o'clock was the curfew so you know we we started getting backlash from the girls they're like no you know y'all talking to 8 o'clock curfew and shit and all that what does that mean that means and this is what I would explain to him that means that if we catch a nigga in Sumner that's not from Sumner after 8 o'clock and we didn't give him the okay to be here he might not make it out of here that's what that means so now when you implement policy and you stand on that type of policy and do see you executing off of that it, 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 it spreads out so word started spreading out around Brooklyn like yo boy some of the boys catch you down as some dudes call themselves the brothers or whatever. The niggas catch you down to something and the projects after eight o'clock, boy, he might be fish food. So we were starting going around like, don't be and listen, we implemented a curfew and, and to enforce that curfew when we implemented what was known as what we call project control. Hey, yo, Z-Man Suicide Polo with the Ski Man. You heard we back with that part five of the Sumner series. Shout out to the God Black Knowledge Brooklyn legend. Shout out to the whole bed star. You heard? We just here documenting that true Brooklyn history, man. That's all we doing. You heard? Comment, gang. I need y'all to tear this to shreds. Slim Blunt gang, let me know you out there repping. You heard, shout out to that truck gang, all my dudes on the road pushing them 18 wheelers across the country, tuning into the channel. You heard, shout out to all the supporters out there that be showing that love. Hey yo, if you out there and your story is worthy of a film or movie or documentary, holla at me, let me know what that story is about. You heard? Email to genpopllc at gmail.com. You want to donate to the channel? Dollar sign genpopfam on Cash App. Somebody was asking me about that too the other day. They was like, yo, if tell Black Knowledge to tell you the story about what them niggas from Sumner did in the courtroom. They wake up. You know what I mean? Wake up. And so I got permission to tell an accurate, 100% correct story. So I'm gonna tell an accurate, 100% correct story. So the legend is, and the myth is that, you know, they was trying to, you know, pull a George Jackson or something. So of that brother escaped. I mean, we implemented a curfew in my hood. And to enforce that curfew, we implemented this thing that we started called uh, Project Patrol where, you know, we would come out like around 7.30 because the curfew was 8 o'clock. So we would come out around 7.30, you know, give the give the wall call, the wall crowd, and dudes would, 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 would uh, congregate wherever the AOs originated from. And um, 
we would break off into sections, groups of like five, six, because you kind of always wanted to have like, because on those patrols, you never know what type of resistance or what you was going to run into. So I always wanted to make sure that, you know what I mean, everybody was covered. I didn't want to just send one or two dudes because you, what happens if you run into a group of dudes and you try to enforce something and, and you know, they, and they, and they grip you just like you are. So try to make sure it was like at least five to seven dudes. Um, every time we were uh, going on project patrol. So what we do is we would start on one side of the project and we would like literally break out, spread into our groups and then like march all through. So the four, so if it's four sides, if we cover the four corners and it's like four groups of dudes and it's like seven dudes to a group, 28, whatever, 24, whatever, or 20, depending on how many dudes it was, we would start off respectively on different sides of the project so that we would kind of meet in the middle after um we ensured that everything was good so we had like a little walk and talk and shit it was crazy because it was kind of mili- it wasn't kind of it was actually militant and and kind of like organized the way we did it so we would talk on a walkie talkie dudes but on the other side of the project we'd be like yo we over this side we over here by truth and murder everything gucci over here you know what i mean no outsiders over here same thing they would say the same shit from the lewis side and all that so um what I told you originally was that the curfew was eight o'clock, and I told you about a situation that um that where we kind of kind of gave a dude a pass, whatever this dude kind of became cool, you know what I mean? With us and was fucked with us late on certain periods of the stories, and and then you know then we weren't really fucking with each other, whatever, whatever. But long story short, a couple cats used to come see the girls that I told you about in my projects, Tiffany and and Novell, and they whole little clique. These dudes were some from Roosevelt. One of the dudes from Roosevelt, his name was Mitch, Mitch Blitz. And I was like, you know, I mean, everybody know, know the story. They know that's my little man and whatever. We kind of came up together, went on the island together and went up top in Elmira and all that. Mitch from Roosevelt, that was one of my homies and all that. And um, Mitch was, a, you know, Mitch was a tough guy. He wasn't, wasn't nothing soft about homie. He was putting on respectively for Roosevelt. You know what I mean? He had a, little cool dudes with them that they was, you know, getting busy, whatever, doing their thing. Roosevelt in proximity was like about two to three blocks, four blocks down from the hood of Sumner. But, and Mitch, again, Mitch knew some dudes from my hood. That was a part of my, you know what I mean, team. He knew um, Hunt and he knew Hatch. And, you know, so some, like I said, some dudes get, get, get passes or whatever just on the strength of who they know or whatever. But the story went that, you know, Mitch was, in the hood, he was probably up the hill on the other side with uh, Tiffany and, and them bros or whatever. And it was coming curfew time. And I guess some of the homies that was on that side on patrol must have approached him and whatever. And, you know, said what, he, said what they said to him. And he kind of like bucked or whatever. Said what he said basically on, on some like, you know I mean, he wasn't going nowhere type of shit. And I guess the dudes that approached him didn't really know who he was. So they called us. We was on the other. We ran over there and shit. Long story short, get there, me and Hash and all of us, we see him. He's like, oh, now nah, hold on, that's my son, uh, Mitch from Roosevelt, he good. So I'm like, all right, homie, well, that's on you. Since you said he good, then you have to explain to your homie, you know what I mean, what the rules are and what we're doing down here. Nothing personal to him, but like, you know what I mean? He, you know, at a certain time, dude's gotta be the fuck up out of here. And that's just how it's going down. There was no, no variation to that or nothing until we got things in line the way we saw fit, you know, the way we got, you know, we felt things were being able to be regulated, organized, because I told you dudes was coming through, violating and coming to see bras and probably backing out hammers on dudes and all that. So I told you we was the hammer hunters too. Dudes had guns, we heard about it. We was marching down on you to take that if we caught you slipping. So basically, Mitch caught the pass that day, you know what I mean? My homie has his friends from whatever, whatever, and he got up out of there. Then years later, when I seen him down the line and we talked about that, we was up north behind the wall, some of the wall stories. He was like, yeah, bro, I remember y'all dudes ran down on me. I, I ain't trying to show no fear, nothing, but I already knew how y'all played. But you know, after that, <laughs> we stopped bringing my asses up there after 8.30, you know what I mean? Unless, you know, we let the homies know. So that was basically protocol, like kind of, sort of. Once the dudes started getting cool and branching out and connecting with other dudes, because it was live dudes, like I said, everywhere. So once dudes was was um connecting with other dudes, 
those same live dudes that we was fucking with that was allowed to come amongst us and come in our hoods and all that would let us know that they come in or send word like you know what i mean because you know hoods are big you know they have several sides more than one side and just you know somebody on one side might not know what's going on necessarily on the other side so that's why we try to always keep those lines of communication open so that everybody would be on the same page and what be those type of incidents where somebody didn't know somebody they was cool they might have had a pass whatever you know what i mean and then dudes get them going back and forth and it, and it leads to a situation so that project patrol was kind of like implemented to 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 stop all the outsiders from coming into the hood and basically you know what i mean disrespecting or doing whatever they wanted to do so yeah that was the that was the project patrol situation so was it any, was it ever anybody who tried to pull out a gun and throw shots at y'all doing that of course it was, of course it was lots of dudes that was uh you know come to was trying to resist whatever but like i said it's about the consistency so we consistently put on with the project patrol and chasing dudes up out the hoods and and, and blaming that dudes mind you this was before the um before the uh the, 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 the wars with with the other cats like the bushwood cats and all that this was in our earliest stages when we was regulating and getting the love and respect of the people from the hoods we was doing that but once you know once we we graduated past that a couple of years after that so the beef stages and the war stages then you know my friends didn't care about your project patrol and all that if they was coming in and try to put work in on you they was coming to put on so you know you know project patrol eventually fizzled out and went out the window but i was just giving you the history of of that period of time when we implemented that but yeah dudes definitely did try to come through and or not come through if they was already in it he's trying to fuck we had a couple of dudes that tried to bump over and go nowhere until you hit them upside the head with the hammer you know what i mean you clunk a couple of dudes upside the head and they get the point and see you're not playing around they get the fuck out of it it's always hard -headed. it's always hard-headed dudes like that just you know that they need a little bit more incentive <laughs> they have to be incentivized you know what I mean, lads? In, 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 a, in a little bit, in a little bit more of a sterner way to get the point. So, yeah, um, that was that was that was that situation. So how with, uh, the how old was y'all when that was going down? You said like the project control. Yeah, like, that was like um, the project control would have been like fifteen, like like fifteen, because we started getting into the heavy heavy serious beefs around around that so yeah project control was like 14 or 15 and then then all the, everything else was from like 15 or 17 18 whatever around that age so the heavy beefs were like putting on the walls and all that other shit is some the one of them hoods that one side don't really fuck with the other side so that's a fact so it, it was like that it was like that before my before we had it and then it was like that after we went to prison like but when we had it we kind of unified it you know what i mean unified so so boom i was a i was the dude that a lot of dudes liked so some of was a couple sides some was my side so on dudes on my side we call it the first side but the dudes on the other side they call their side the first side my side is the side from um so if you was on marcus garvey and you went to the right marcus garvey's a, uh, a one way so if you um going up Marcus Garvey from let's say Park Avenue so if you're on Park and Marcus Garvey you go straight up to Myrtle you make the right on Myrtle so now you are you are Myrtle you're on Myrtle Avenue between um um Sumner Ave and then you go down to Troop you make that right on Troop Avenue and you take Troop Avenue from Troop Avenue back over to Park Avenue so that's the square so you have Park Sumner Myrtle Troop that's one side that's the, the right side, the first side, whatever, the second side, the side close to the 59 Park. Across the street from us, on the left side of, of, of Marcus Garvey would be, I mean, Sumner Ave, it would be the same thing. It would be Park Ave, then it would be Sumner Ave, then it would be to the left, Myrtle Ave. Take Myrtle Ave up to Lewis Ave, then you turn left down Lewis Ave, and you bring Lewis Ave back down the um, Park Ave, and that's the other side. So that's the two sides. So before I came... Before we came into it, um, it was, it was, and then it's two sides. Again, four sides. So it's the Myrtle side, two sides on each side of the project. 
the, the Myrtle side, which is we consider up the hill, and the Park Ave side, which we consider down the hill. So it's the up the hill dudes on the Park on the Myrtle Ave side, the down the hill dudes on the Park Ave side. Same thing across the street. Up the hill dudes on the Myrtle Avenue side, down the hill dudes on the Park Avenue side. So at at various times throughout the history of some of the, the dudes from the Park Avenue side was going at it with the dudes from the Myrtle Avenue side on both sides of the projects. Or it would be the dudes from the other side of my projects by the, by the Myrtle and Lewis and uh, Park was going at it with the dudes from my side, which was the, um, the Park Ave, uh, something in truth. So, yeah, those were the wars with, you know, I mean, not, I can't even say wars, those were situations, because before me, you know, dudes was, was, was going at it and shit, but it's kind of like, so the dudes before me, the hits and all them, the, the, the Nilses and the, um, the hits and the Agars and the Naturals and all them, they kind of, kind of showed us a little bit of, of what a blend would look like, because hits was from my building in the back on the Sumner and Park Avenue side, and, and Natural, and all of them, hates and, and I got and, and knowledge. And then a natural and, and, and Shannon and all them dudes was up from the from the Myrtle Avenue side. And then the dude VL that, that used to be running around with them, he was from up there on the um on the Lewis Avenue and Myrtle side. So we, when them dudes used to come through and then and then Maj, uh Majesty was from my side in front of my building. Originally he was on the Sumner Ave. His mom's them lived in that building there, then, then uh, Linda, we referred to her back then as Mama Lynn, she moved over to the Park Avenue side in front of my building, and Madge was, you know what I mean, so me and Madge was in buildings facing each other, like my building here and building across the grass facing my building. So when them dudes was running running around, Hicks and all them, or whatever, and then Madge used to be running with them, all them dudes, that was a combination of everybody. That was a combination of down the hill, on the Park Avenue side, up the hill on the Murder Avenue side, the my side of the projects, and then across the street with VL them. So they kind of showed us a little bit of what it would look like if you had dudes incorporated from all on the whole encompassing Sumner, and then we took it thirty levels beyond that once they went to jail and we started running. We incorporated the whole projects, practically dudes from every building in the projects. At one point or another, we was rocking out, and you know we was running around, running up in other projects, and, and, and doing what we was doing, and going to war with other dudes, and doing what we was doing respectively for our projects. And everybody that was from Sumner knew that, you know, when you from Sumner, you gotta, it's it's a lot of shoes to fill because, like I said, like so my big homies, I got and Hicks and all that, when they caught their case and they went to jail, and we was resonating, um, coming up behind them, trying to make our names resonate and our name falls in the hood they was putting on in prison so we would constantly talk to them on the phone and hear about the stories of them putting on in prison they, those were the dudes that in 87 uh, uh, changed the way you know cats forever went to court in, 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 in Brooklyn well, somebody was asking me about that too the other day they was like yo if I tell black knowledge to tell you the story about what them niggas from Sumner did in the courtroom Right, so that, that's that's a funny transitional story because as I'm leading into it, look, so that's crazy. So you're getting actual history because you're 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 being you're you're getting inquir inquiries about stuff that I didn't even tell you about with respect to 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 the some of the history and, and how our legacy came about and how dudes felt you know they had to live up to certain standards and fill shoes and, and take it even bigger. So the story with that was like, you know, my, like I said, my big homies, um, uh, at the time it was our God, his brother Hicks, uh, Natural, and Shannon, if I'm not mistaken, those four individuals. And, uh, you know, they, you know, they had whatever they had, they legal situation, whatever, they was fighting the man down, whatever, and you know, they was, respectively on an island and um you know so deep so so i got had already did time right so i got had already did time so i got was just fresh coming home in that part of the 80s when we was coming up putting on so whatever ig i got with that's what we call it ig whatever ig was doing with his homies that was holding us 
that was before our time. So when he came home, he saw that we had the hood. So you know, he used to come through war stories, whatever, whatever. Auntie was more militant. Hickey Doo was the fly one. All the jewels. Hickey Doo always had the bad chicks coming through. He the one who he the one who got us steamed out for the for the trail bikes and the motorcycles and all that. Natural was on some some pretty boy chocolate type shit. He was up the hill. He was always fresh in his valleys and his tight nylons because Natural did a bit and he was I think he was from from the islands, one of the West Indian islands, and he had one of the physiques that you know when he worked out, he crazy chisel. And, and then, you know, Shannon. Shannon was just a big, having set dude, whatever, whatever. So they had this situation. They was in court. So the stories that, that I got from Hicks and Agard and all them, the main characters, the main players in them situations, was like, Agard was like, listen, bro. And this is straight from Agard's mouth. When he told it to me, years later, guys, he told the story to me. He was like, listen, guys, bro, I had just finished giving them people all that time. I didn't really get a chance to... You know what I mean? Shot and do my thing on the streets and shit. And then I caught that situation and, and you know, you know, still folded and, and told and all that wild shit. His thing was like, if he had to go back up top and, and if he get found guilty, they was going to remember him. You know what I mean? He was going to do something. And he was going to put on magnificently so that his, because he figured that if he was going back up top, he was never going to see the streets again. So he wanted to make a statement. So as the story went, you know, they blew trial or whatever, whatever. And I'm not sure, you know, the fact checkers could whatever straighten it out or, or give their input. I'm not sure if it was that the actual sentencing, you know what I mean, when they got their time or when it was at the point where where um they caught the guilty verdict from the jury. But, you know, they turned up. Back then it was easier to sneak knives and Raises and all that into the into the court pens and all that. You wasn't handcuffed and all of that the way and shackled the way they you know implemented after that situation. So I don't I'm not sure again if it was after the guilty verdict or if it was upon sentencing when they heard the time that they got they waked out. You know what I mean? Waked out. And so I got permission to tell an accurate 100% correct story. So I'm gonna tell an accurate 100% correct story. So the legend is. And the myth is that, you know, they was trying to, you know, pull a George Jackson or something. Soul of that brother escaped. That wasn't it. What happened was, again, like I said, you know, somebody in the situation didn't stand tall and, you know, gave up statements and, and, and went to the left, I guess. And then brothers felt that, that um, you know, the, the result of them losing was because of, you know, this person that, that didn't stand tall. So... They was trying to get to this person, you know what I mean? Where some people thought they was just trying to get to the police to get up out the courtroom. No, they was trying to stab this person and cut this person or kill this person, get at this person. And, the you know, the court officers tried to intervene and get in the way of that or try to prevent that from happening. And then it went from not only trying to get you, but fuck it, we might as well just go all out and get crazy to banging up the police officers. So that's what happened. They was going after somebody that didn't stand tall in the situation. The court officers intervened and they bang, banged out the court officers, stabbed up court officers, cut court officers and all that. And, you know, they ended up getting extra time on top of the, like, you know, the sentences. And the crazy shit is everybody home now. Man, this was back in the 80s. So all of the dudes that I mentioned that was involved in that particular situation, everybody home now, doing their thing, flourishing, and, you know, living a productive, positive, okay. positive life. But it was that something to see that. Did any lawyers or DAs get cut? Um, I would I would probably have to get with my big bros and find out exactly who got cut. But yeah, everybody, everybody was getting it. Whoever didn't get out of Dodge was getting it. But normally, you know how the judge probably hit the deck or flew through the back door, top speed, bitch ass style like they do. And the lawyers, you know how they do, tuck and roll, running over, they probably got out of the way. The security staff, the correction officers, they have to, you know, engage. The, the lawyers and the judge don't have to engage. The court officers have to engage all, uh, you know, any hostile acts. So they engaged, and, and I guess they probably thought that when they engaged, that dudes were just going to comply and put their hands behind their back, and nah, it didn't go like that. They got a lesson in, 
and 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 some the history, and they became a part of some the history and the legend of some the through the acts of you know I mean my big bros when they put on put on in the corporate. So look, when dudes do stuff like that, right, lads, and they from your hood, it just I don't know, just from us being in the hood and the way we grew up, it it that's like legendary to us because nobody did that. Us. So our thing was, how can we top that? And the way my team, the way we top that was our situation that we got into with the police. So that's going to be, you know, another, you know, as these stories developing, our situation was all right. The homies put on with the court officers and all that, and they got guns in there and all that. But okay, so we used to sit around. We used to always sit around, lads. And court just, officers had know. guns at that time. Yeah, I was quite sure court officers had guns. Yeah. Court officers carry guns. I, I'm quite sure they. I, well, you might. You. I. You. I might have to fact check. <laughs> they might have changed the sure. law. They might have been the ones that made them dudes start carrying guns in the courtroom. After that, right? Okay, so that might be a fact. It might came after, me, but I know that from the last interaction that I recall from going to court, I would see them with the hammers. Yeah, they had maybe now. Yeah, what now I see them with the hammers all the time, but I wonder if they had the hammers. What year you said that happened in? That happened in uh, 1987. Mm. 1987. So whoever be doing, the, you know, checking on that history could check to see if court officers had hammers back then or if they just had, I don't know what the, if they didn't have hammers, what they had? Handcuffs? A nightstick? Mace? I mean, they had to have something, right? Because well, how would they deter or, or deflect or, or neutralize a situation or somebody might be trying to break out or somebody might try to run in there with the blicky and, and break their man out or some you know, this is real life shit, homie. I mean, this is how we used to think. So people that hear these stories and think, oh, that's so far fetched, they wouldn't have did that. Yeah, we would have did that. And we was doing that and we did more than that. Facts. This is you know, this is Brooklyn's factual history. None of this shit is made up or fantasy, nothing. I told you before that everything was real. And everything that we was doing, homie, was real. So, right. So they just, they, they, they just gave them, dude, they, they ran their sentences for that concurrent with they, with, with the life, the, the trial that they had blown. Or did they get more time for that and all of that? Yeah, so I think that time was ran consecutive to the time that they got. So, as a result of that situation, everybody got the quarter. Even even a dude that, you know, didn't stand tall like that. So that was the confusion shit to us, right? And that's enough, like that, we go definitely, and I told you before, Alas, before I even agreed to do this, these conversations, which I said, we're gonna talk about everything. And so what I'm leading up to with the everything is that, like I, like I said, everybody got a quarter, including the dude that didn't stand tall I don't know how he did it. He made the statements or whatever, whatever. So back then, you know, that was considered telling to us. So my thing was, damn, boy, you told, and you still got the same amount of time as everybody else. You still got the elbow. You got that. You got that tag on your jacket that you gotta live with for the rest of your life, and you go. You got official cats riding after you. So, so when we talk about this telling shit, guys, and how prevalent it is, and how Except it is, we, we, we man, that's this that one right there is is gonna be a hot one because that bothers me a lot because you know when I went every time I went to the joint it was because of a dude that told that was supposed to be stand up and watch it, bro. Like, and my thing is this, bro. Everybody's not a street cat, right? Everybody don't put on the same way, right? But you know, as young men, we knew. The differences between rights and wrongs, and for the most part, we made conscious decisions. So, with respect to that type of shit, homie, with me, if you make a conscious decision to live a certain way of life, you're supposed to stand on that. With everything that comes with it. So, sometimes I'm thinking, like, what do dudes think? That everything in the street life is, is, is glitz and glam and, and glory without no penalties or consequences. You think you just gonna have a run of a reign of terror or, or, or a spree of getting money without having to face some sort of legal consequences? Everybody in the game knows that the game comes with consequences. So how dudes can try to justify 
backdoor situations and, and, and telling and, and, and getting out of situations to, to just to save their own ass, it bothers me. And that's why when we had that private conversation about, you know, I was like, damn, last, like, you know, we got to talk about some things before I put myself on your platform because, you know, you may have did put these type of people on and I don't fuck with that or whatever. I said what I said. You said what you said. We ended up respecting it. I'm having a difference of opinion because that can happen. People can disagree, agree to disagree, respect the other person's position, and then move forward. So my position has always been and it's always gonna be, bro. I don't stand with nobody that 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 do no telling type of shit to benefit themselves at the expense of somebody else. If we a crew, a team of dudes, and we are putting on and we know the consequences of, of our acts. If it ever comes a time that we gonna be held accountable and have to stand caught for our acts, then I expect everybody to stand firm on and, and hold it down. If they can prove what we did, then they can prove we will take, we ain't agreeing, popping out to nothing unless they show us that they got us. That's how the game goes. It's just, you gotta show, well, at least for me was, I'm going to trial unless you show me that you got me. If I see that you got me and there's no other way for me to go out, then I might take a deal or whatever, but no cooperation, but I might plead guilty. But if you, I feel like you can't prove what you alleging or charging me, then we go on the trial. And that's it. I'm not telling on nobody to get out of my situation and all that because when I was doing whatever the fuck it was that I was doing, that I knew that was illegal, I understood the consequences, homie, and I respected it and I was willing to take those chances and I did what I did. So for me to fall under pressure, like boy, nah, because I, to us, like I said, we wanted to go to jail, so fuck it. If we go to jail, we gonna put on, ain't gonna be no teller, we go to jail, we gonna put on the same way we was putting on in the streets. Dudes gonna respect us and hear about us all through the jails, the same way they respected us and heard about us in the street. So all of the, the vague excuses and the ambiguous excuses and then the extravagant excuses and all that shit I hear about dudes giving on numerous of these internet shits about telling and all that. Now, nah, homie, you ain't gonna get that from over here. You, you gonna get the shit that dudes ain't gonna like to hear, which is the real deal. You supposed to hold it down, homie. That's what we did. We held it down. We, 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 we supposed to hold it down because I, I get it. Everybody say different sets of rules, dudes don't abide by Whatever, the, I done heard all the streets is dead old dudes is following codes that other dudes don't get. Yeah, dude, dudes is dudes is not following codes and doing all that other shit, homie, because nobody's implementing nothing and standing on nothing. Like you see, dudes embracing dudes for telling and and, and making up excuses for why they told and taking a position and attitude like fucking you didn't tell on me, so I ain't got no problem with them. You know, we cool, you know, fuck it. Long as he ain't telling me I'm cool now, nah, bro. A snitch or a rat or whatever is like a snake, bro. And the way I was taught, you always supposed to cut a snake head off. Because if you don't cut a snake's head off, you're gonna give him a chance to slither around you and bite you again and some other and even because that's the, the nature of a snake, it's just gonna bite something to and eat. That's it. And the reality and is, bro, bite. the reality is dudes. Dudes that stand firm like you is a very small minority in the streets because the shit that I've read, like, you know, I read a lot, bro. The shit that I've read and I read a lot of motherfucking, you know, books about crime and punishment and the statistics is staggering on how many people actually tell. You feel me? So when I when I do this background research and find out how many motherfuckers done told, that shit is a that shit is a serious uh sign to stay the fuck out the streets and, and leave leave the streets alone, my nigga. Because you know, according to statistics, they say one in three active criminals is either a, also an active informant or was at one time. A active informant You feel me? Like the streets is treacherous And it is a few motherfuckers 
a handful of niggas that they ain't never gonna break those rules. They gonna go to jail for the rest of their life before they ruin their reputation and be called the rat. But the average motherfuckers, bro, they gonna save their own ass and tell. With telling on those and all that. So my thing is, those, those statistics that you started, not only are they alarming and somewhat scary, but to me personally, they're disgusting. And the reason that they're disgusting is because there's no reason for the telling. So, so like, and the reason I say there's no reason for the telling because you can simply do the time and then or you can simply fight the case like a lot of times bro what dudes don't understand strictly speaking to the younger generation of individuals that's in the street yo if you could get out of the streets and find something more productive and better to do do that but if you choose not to do that and you playing the street game no one understand that this street game more than likely is going to um, involve consequences. And some of those consequences are either going to be you getting your shit knocked off or you having to stand before, you know what I mean, the court of law and, 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 and answer to what they consider to be crimes. My thing is that in knowing that, right, knowing what, what your options are, possible death or prison or whatever, then you have to think and say, and wait, wait, right? Say, do I want to do that? Not. Nah. Okay, if I do decide to do that, then let me do that with, with, with some with some 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 morals and some res, with, with, with some respect and some some you know some codes of ethics. Let me you know if, let me stand on what I say I'm gonna do. If I'm gonna be a criminal, then I'm gonna be a real criminal. I'm not gonna be no half-assed criminal. I'm not gonna fool and 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 and, and tell under pressure and all that shit. Like I said, those statistics of dudes telling all that, that's a fact. It's alarming and, and, and it's and it's and it's disgusting. But you know, sometimes I think a lot of shit happens because where's the where's the where's the where's the OGs giving out the game? Where's the where's the dudes giving out the insightful information? Yeah.